Military mercenaries are jailed for a mass shooting in Iraq, reigniting the debate over the use of private security contractors. Have soldiers of fortune become a necessary part of modern conflict? This is Inside Story. There. Welcome to the program. I'm Shuli Ghosh. Good to have you with us. From opportunistic guns for hire on the fringe of domestic conflicts to a global force operating within a multi-billion dollar industry, the world of the military mercenary has become big business. Private companies have taken on an increasing range of responsibilities as war is outsourced from security and intelligence analysis to training and combat roles. It's been a controversial issue, and on Tuesday, the U.S. State Department offered assurances that it had strengthened rules governing private security firms in the wake of a 2007 shooting in Iraq in which 14 civilians were killed. A court in Washington, D.C. on Monday sentenced a former Blackwater guard to life in prison and three others to 30 years for their role in the mass shooting in Baghdad. The prosecutor described it as an unprovoked ambush of civilians. The incident cast a spotlight on the use of private contractors in conflict zones and raised questions about oversight and accountability. Reaction after the court case reflects the polarizing nature of this issue. These men are not the heartless, sinister caricatures that have been cast type into so many movies. These are honest, courageous, patriotic, and most of all, ordinary men with families, including wives and young children who sacrificed their youth and the innocence for the purpose of preserving life, not taking it. They risked their lives to protect our liberties and theirs. All four of these men have served in the armed forces honorably and each have impressive and lengthy records of awards and commendations for their bravery, integrity, and restraint. We're confident in the merits of the appeal and we will not stop fighting for true justice until these men come home. The sentence issued by the American federal court could not be compared with the bulk of the crime that took place in the Nassau Square in 2007. More than 20 people were killed. More than 30 or 35 others were wounded. The penalty was not at the level of the crime. If the trial had occurred here in Iraq, the sentence would be death by hanging. Well, the way many people now view private military companies has been shaped by the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. The U.S. Department of Defense spent around $160 billion on private contractors in both countries between 2007 and 2012. At the height of each conflict, contractors made up 48% of the workforce in Iraq and around 57% of the U.S. presence in Afghanistan. In 2009, the then Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, confessed that mistakes had been made in how the U.S. employed private military contractors. He said contractors were used without any supervision or without any coherent strategy, as well as without conscious decisions about what we will allow contractors to do and what we won't allow contractors to do. Plenty to talk about there. Let's introduce today's guests. In Washington, D.C., we have Sean McFate, a former military contractor and author of the book The Modern Mercenary. In Pittsburgh, Molly Dunnigan, a political scientist who researches private military contractors at the Rand Corporation. And also in Washington, D.C., Phyllis Bennis, a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. Welcome to all my guests today. Sean, let me start with you because you work for DynCorp International. This was a private military contractor which was working in Burundi about 10 years ago, I gather, because the U.S. didn't want anyone to know that it was involved in that. Is that a fairly common reason as to why private contractors are used? That's one of the reasons why contractors are used, is they can do things that often the military or the intelligence community could do but may not want to do. Um, in some ways, this industry is more secretive than the military or the CIA because uh, the CIA and the military have congressional oversight hearings. Reporters have uh, sort of legal mechanisms to ask questions of these agencies and departments. Um, but this is all protected by contracting companies as proprietary knowledge. So it's actually very difficult for researchers to get information about this industry. So what kind of things are you talking about that contractors can do that the U.S. government wouldn't want to do? 
Well, and certainly, for example, um, in Africa, where I worked for DynCorp, DynCorp raised uh, military uh, with another contractor for the country of Liberia, which many of your listeners will recall from the Ebola incidences this past summer. Um, raising militaries, as we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, is dangerous business. Uh, it's also not something that the U.S. military likes to think of, of as a core competency. So it's easier often to uh, outsource this. Uh, also, if a mission is too dangerous or politically sensitive, sometimes contractors give policymakers what we call plausible deniability if something goes wrong. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. But when it comes to the infamous Blackwater case, it's fair, fair to say that the reputation of these companies has been badly damaged. There is a perception that companies like this, like the one that you used to work for, are often, uh, you know, operating above the law. That's right. So the incident in Nisor Square, especially, is one of the low points of the Iraq War. And these contractors uh, committed crimes. There's no question about that. Um, the, the industry has a lot of positive and also a lot of negative a uh, aspects to it. And certainly linking profit motive with warfare uh, c causes great concern for many. Um, but not all contractors are bad, and that's the point here to make. Okay. Molly, uh, you're a researcher. Sean there saying that often it's difficult for researchers to find out exactly how private companies, are, uh, uh, contractors are operating or wh what exactly they're doing. Um, d it is the fact, isn't it, that, that contractors, uh, I mean, it seems to me that in recent years, they, they seem to have exploded in number onto the international stage. Definitely they have. Um, they were present in the Balkans Wars and in the first Gulf War, but with um, Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom, they just exploded. And part of this is because they have a very strong force multiplying aspect. Um, it's also important to distinguish between the different types of contractors that you're speaking about. So the Nisar Square Blackwater contractors were private security contractors uh, performing personal security details for State Department personnel. But you also have large numbers of logistical support contractors, base operations and maintenance support contractors, people working on bases, setting things up on bases, doing things like construction, cleaning latrines, cooking. Um, running mess halls and so uh, there's sort of a wide variety um, I'm guessing that what the people I'm guessing that what people are most worried about are the contractors who work in specific combat and security situations though definitely those are the most controversial because they're armed and even though they are technically only supposed to operate defensively they're put in situations where sometimes that line becomes blurry and, and do they operate in a legal gray area for the most part, it is a fairly gray area because there are jurisdictional issues. You have contractors operating outside of the United States, and sometimes they're third country nationals. So you'll have contractors, for instance, from Peru or Uganda hired on a U.S. contract paid by the United States to operate in Iraq or Afghanistan. And there's just a question of what state laws apply and who has jurisdiction to try them. Phyllis, what's you've, your view on this? As a result of Blackwater, has there been uh, any changes in accountability or oversight of private military contractors? Well, one would hope so, but I don't think we see evidence of it yet. The Blackwater verdict and the sentencing uh, was important. It wasn't enough. I mean, they got the, mil the minimum sentence. The 30 years was a minimum that the judge could give, and that's what he gave them uh, for the four out of the five. But I think that what is important here is to recognize why the issue of contractors and mercenaries has become so important. It's because the U.S. going to war in Iraq was so unpopular and because the Bush administration, particularly Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, had this notion that clearly proved to be ridiculous, uh, which many said was ridiculous to begin with, that he could go to war on the cheap, that he could go to war with a, quote, light footprint with a very small army. And what that meant was a small official army where there is at least the uh, illusion of some level of accountability up the chain of command. In fact, we don't see any real accountability up the chain of command even in the military. If you look at, for example, the Abu Ghraib crisis, the only people who did any time, and it was a matter of very short sentences, were three or four very low-ranking soldiers. Up the chain of command, no one paid a price. But what Rumsfeld did was to say, we don't have enough soldiers, but we don't need them. That's okay. That's a good thing. We're going to have just a light footprint. And what that led to, as we just heard, is that half the people 
uh, fighting and doing all the work that ordinarily in any ordinary army the, the privates and corporals would be doing, whether it's cleaning latrines or, or driving or cleaning or whatever, cooking, all those things were done by paid contractors. Not all of but, them But what armed, about Sean's point that sometimes this is this. necessary, that sometimes this is a, a necessary evil, if you like, well, that we have to use these people? Necessary evils are evil. And who says that they're necessary? Who says that it was in the interest of the Liberian people, for example, to, quote, raise up an army by a force unaccountable to anybody either in Liberia or here in the United States. I would contest that. You know, somebody can say, well, we have to do this because the military can't. Well, why can't they? Because there's oversight. Why does oversight prevent it? Because it's not but acceptable is there not also either by law or morality. Is there also an issue that uh, the U.S. government, for example, uh, is very, very allergic to seeing high numbers of troop casualties? Is this a way around that? Well, yes, and that's a huge problem because what you're saying is they are, quote, allergic to huge numbers of U.S. casualties, but they're perfectly willing to accept huge numbers of Iraqi casualties, Iraqi civilians, Afghan civilians, Yemeni civilians. You know, this is the problem that we face here. People are dying in huge numbers. The question is, are they soldiers or are they civilians? Are they U.S. soldiers or are they soldiers of another country? It's not acceptable for the U.S. to say, the, m the most important thing we can do is protect our soldiers' lives. If that's their concern, let them keep the soldiers home, if that's the primary concern. Soldiers are trained to do two things, kill people and break things. That's the goal of a military. The goal of humanitarian workers, of course, is to pick up the pieces afterwards. The military contractors are doing the work of militaries, killing people and breaking things, and that is something that all right well let me let me put that to does, sean because there's no accountability uh, presumably this is obviously sean you, you you've written this 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 book about you know the, the the structure and what it is exactly that um these these companies do on the ground um is phyllis right when she says that th these companies are increasingly taking on the role of the army in a way that should not be acceptable well, I think she raises a lot of good points, including, you know, using this industry as a way to have, you know, two 10-year-long wars when the U.S.'s own military, which is all volunteer, cannot muster enough volunteers to do it. Contractors allow you to do that, and otherwise you'd have to have a draft, like Vietnam, and that would be political suicide. But, but why should we be relying on, on men who are essentially accountable to their shareholders, to their company boss, rather than a government? Hmm. Well, this, this is the core issue. I mean, who, I don't agree with everything she says, but, but it's true is that by outsourcing this to the private sector, you're dependent on the private sector to wage war, and you don't have full control. That said, let's not forget that also national militaries also commit human rights violations. Abu Ghraib is an example. We talk about Nusra Square, but we don't think about Haditha. In 2005, a squad of U.S. Marines killed not 17 innocent Iraqis, but 24. And that very little happened to them either. I mean, in some ways, we have more accountability of both Blackwater contractors than we have with the U.S. Marine yeah, that's, Corps. That's a so good I don't point. think that's fair for her to say. Well, let me put this to Molly then. Uh, we've privatized pretty much everything else. Why shouldn't we privatize uh, people who are fighting in combat missions? It's a great question. Um, I mean, I think we've gotten down the path of privatization so far. There's no question that this industry is not going to go away anytime soon. Um, there are ways to hold them accountable. They're not the typical legal mechanisms. It seems or very difficult to hold them accountable, though, doesn't it? I mean, Blackwater took so long to get a decision, and the guy who founded the company, nothing's happened to him. Blackwater's still operating, albeit under a different name. It's very true. Uh, one of the best ways to hold them accountable is through contract mechanisms. I mean, these are profit-motivated entities. How do you hold business accountable? Absolutely. I can, I can for see Phyllis any sort of business. Phyllis shaking her head as well. You, you don't like that uh, idea I of privatizing war, do no. you? Well, first of all, I think that we've had huge problems as the result of massive privatization in terms of the loss of jobs, the loss of a whole set of the of economic uh, 
problems in this country, including massive inequality, it has everything to do with privatization. That's a different discussion. But when we look at the question of privatizing war, part of it is about accountability. But the notion of profit, the notion that war profiteers are making these decisions. Eric Prince, who founded Blackwater, was a huge uh, contributor to the Republican Party. He's not just somebody who's accountable to his shareholders. He's somebody that members of Congress and the White House depend on for their campaign funding. So when you're talking about who gets the contract here, let's look at what the political realities are. Who gained? Who benefited? There's the old saying, who benefits from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? Well, the main ones who benefited were Eric Prince and the other CEOs of these military contracting firms and the military production firms that make the bombs, that make the planes, that make all of the equipment that, were, that was being used uh, in, in, these, in these wars. So the notion that somehow that is driving the war is one of the huge problems of these wars. These are not wars to defend the United States. It's not surprising that public opposition to these wars was as high as it, as it remained. And when public opposition is that high, and the government knows it would be, quote, political suicide to go to war. And so they hire mercenaries to do it instead so they can do it quietly and on the cheap and nobody will know. The problem is people in Iraq know. The families of those that the Blackwater mercenaries killed, they know, just like the people who were killed in all of the other atrocities committed by both U.S. soldiers and U.S. mercenaries. Yeah. People in Iraq don't make much of a distinction. They don't really care whether their child was killed by a Blackwater mercenary or by a U.S. general. Sean, what do you, what do you say States. to that? Because uh, it, 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 Phyllis is saying that, you know, mercenaries are, are being used to go to war and go to war on the cheap. And uh, when there are these abuses, you know, the person uh, or, or victims of this abuse doesn't really care who's, who's doing it. They just know that this is the case. Well, I think that's true. I mean, I don't think your local Iraqi can distinguish between a U.S. Army soldier and a Blackwater Guard. They're both sort of foreigners in summer-looking garb carrying guns who speak English. And I think that's a fair point. Good and I think, that. you know, we have more regulation about, you know, the, crea the manufacturing of toys than we do about the outsourcing of firepower. My concern is not so much Iraq and Afghanistan, but what's going to happen next? And I think we're seeing this in Nigeria, for example. And there's not a whole lot of international outrage against Nigeria hiring mercenaries to go after Boko Haram. And somebody's going to think, well, why don't we hire them to go after ISIS or Al-Shabaab or, or whatever? OK, let Already me stop you, you there, because that, yeah. that, that brings yeah. us neatly on to uh, the, the, um, the, the view of the growth of private military contractors. As uh, Sean has mentioned there, mercenaries have been used by rulers since ancient times. But the emergence of private military companies is a comparatively recent phenomenon. Uh, many mercenaries went to work in Africa after the end of the Second World War, joining wars in Angola, Sierra Leone, uh, and what was then Congo and Rhodesia. As troop levels fell after the end of the Cold War, private military companies increased. They became involved in the Balkans, as we've heard, and the former Yugoslavia, the first Gulf War, then Iraq and Afghanistan. And it was at this time that the U.S. privatized many military functions, allowing mercenaries to serve in place of conventional forces. But critics argue it's not always clear who is doing what and where. Reports surfaced in March suggesting that South African mercenaries have been fighting against Boko Haram in Nigeria. Uh, Phyllis, Sean makes the point that, you know, there's been very little censure of other governments using mercenaries uh, it seems that the US has started a trend so as we've seen Nigeria among others using mercenaries to take on Boko Haram no, it's a huge problem around the world but I would say that some governments are actually trying to rein it in as opposed to giving it more support as we are here in the United States in South Africa there was a huge problem after the overthrow of apartheid that a lot of white South Africans from the military and police forces who were real supporters, real racist dogs, if you will, real supporters of apartheid, they wanted to kill people. They wanted to attack black people. And they became a very big part of the mercenary force across Africa. The South African government is trying to deal with that. They've made it illegal for South Africans to go abroad uh, to fight. They haven't encouraged it. It still happens. But it's not something that the government encourages. Our government not only encourages it, but creates the opportunity for much higher pay for mercenaries at the, at the individual level. The amount of money that a Blackwater or a Dine Corps or anybody else gets as an armed mercenary in Iraq or Afghanistan is way more than the equivalent 
uh, pay of a soldier doing the same thing. Okay. So there's there's issues there. But okay. It's also a problem of accountability. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, we're, we're coming back to accountability, uh, Molly, uh, is it um, is it a worry? that more governments appear to be using mercenaries, that this seems to be the way that governments are going instead of using their own armies to deal with a security problem, they just hire someone in to do it. There are certainly risks involved with it, but there are also benefits. Um, they do have a very high utility in a lot of their operations. One of the things that I've argued in my writings, and I know Sean has argued in his as well, is that these guys do have uses and you have to you have to manage the risks as best you can. One of the risks is that they can really hinder military effectiveness. Um, they can have problems coordinating with military forces on the ground that they're operating alongside and that's that's problematic. But there are ways to control that. There are ways to So how do we control that? Is there any scope for some overarching, standardized, uh, legally binding guidelines on how these uh, companies operate? There are actually several mechanisms that are being developed right now that will not be necessarily legally binding, but are um, uh, several international codes of conduct that have been developed by the industry in accordance with governments and as well as um, civil society organizations. There's an international code of conduct. There's also something called the PSC-1 standard, which is developed by the American National Standards Institute. And that actually does have teeth to it because it's auditable. It's a, a very long document. It's about 200 pages, and companies have to show that they are in compliance with it in order to get private security contracts fed out by the Pentagon nowadays. Um, and, and you it do ha have to work that way, react though, to the audits for that. Sean, do you think it's possible to uh, come up with a set of uh, rules and regulations which will govern what these companies can and can't do? I think um, I remain very skeptical about regulation. I mean, ultimately, I, I think the, the, um, the things that Molly has raised are great starts. Um, but my concern is if you regulate this industry too much, it'll simply move offshore. And it doesn't regulate, for example, the mercenaries in Nigeria. And I don't think we're going to see a, you know, some Geneva Protocol dealing with armed contractors in our lifetime. And even if that occurred, it would be very difficult to enforce. I think ultimately we have to face the reality that a market for force is amongst us now, as it was in, say, the European Middle Ages. And we have to adapt to it. Uh, there's no turning back, as Molly said earlier. But there are some really worrying things. I mean, you know, executive outcomes, the South African group accused that. of grabbing control of gold, oil and diamond regions, Aegis Defense Services accused of randomly shooting Iraqi civilians, your own company, your former company, DynCorp, accused of sex trafficking and abusing civilians and nothing ever happened, you know, nothing, there was no court case or uh, charges or anything. Th this can't be allowed to continue, can it? I, I agree with you, and just to be clear, uh, DynCorp is not my company. I work for no, DynCorp. No, I said former company. I don't work for I DynCorp do know anymore. you don't work yeah. for them anymore. Oh, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, no, I, I share these concerns, and the question is what happens to unsupervised or uh, unemployed mercenaries? They become bandits. They become racketeers. They can. Um, you know, and there's impunity, and there's serious CEOs. issues in a world where you have uh, mercenaries is a world where you have more war because you know mercenaries are incentivized to elongate war and even start it and even though I don't see that right now we have a lot of historical evidence that happened in the past okay very briefly ladies Molly is this just the reality on the ground now for better or for worse they're here to stay well I, I have to say I do think that the industry has evolved um, so yes well I don't think it's going away we definitely are not seeing companies in the same frame as executive outcomes anymore. Um, they were very paramilitary, and that there's been sort of normative opprobrium has definitely sort of weeded those guys out for the most part, in my view. Uh, Phyllis, very quickly, do you agree? I hope that the sentencing of the Blackwater defendants will have that effect, but I think the bottom line is we've got to stop these wars that allow the United States government to rely on mercenaries. The wars are unacceptable, the use of mercenaries is unacceptable, and they're using the mercenaries because the war are, is publicly unacceptable. Okay. That's what we have to build. It's not okay to say it's here forever. Great to get all your thoughts on this uh, subject. Thank you very much indeed to all my guests today. Sean McFate and Phyllis Bennis in Washington, D.C., and Molly Dunnigan in Pittsburgh.
And thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. Now, you can get in touch with us. Go straight to our programme page at aljazeera.com. Post your comments at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story or tweet us at AJ Inside Story. From all the team here, until next time, bye for now.